Lord, Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for uh, cake. We want to thank you for uh, your presence with us through the gifts in approaching us and reaching out to us. And Lord, the gift of your word, the gift of who you are, Lord, help us to grasp that this morning. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay, first and foremost, we are sorting out the laptop. We're either going to defrag it or throw it in the bin. It's going to be one or the other. I personally go for bin. But uh, the treasurer, on the other hand, quite rightly, is ensuring that we try every avenue first. And then you're right, I want to get an apple. No, oh, sorry. <laughs> there are other makes, but I'm not the BBC, so I can advertise whatever I wish, whenever I wish. Asus. Anyway, no, I'm only joking. So we're not using the laptop for the Bible scripture today. But mind you, I'm not really holding on to one piece. I'm jumping all over the place. So Psalm 99 states this. The Lord is king. Amen. Do you know, if this was a synagogue right now, you'll get lots of those. The Lord is king. Amen. Let the nations tremble. Amen. Yeah, you can. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. I'm glad you're with us this morning. Bless you. Let the nations tremble. Amen. He sits on his throne between the cherubim. Let the whole earth quake. Amen. The Lord sits in majesty in Zion, exalted above all the nations. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Your name is holy. Amen. Mighty King, lover of justice, you have established fairness. You have acted with justice and righteousness throughout Zion. Exalt the Lord our God. Amen. Bow low before his feet, for he is holy. Amen. Shall I just wind it down then? No, oh. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel was also called on his name. They cried to the Lord for help and he answered them. He spoke to Israel from the pillar of cloud and they followed the laws and decrees he gave them. O oh Lord our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them, but you punished them when they went wrong. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain in Jerusalem. For the Lord our God is holy. Amen. Excellent. What does holy mean to you? What does holy mean to you? You can just do one word answers. That's absolutely fine. Perfect. 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 Dedicated to God. Dedicated to God. Living without sin. Living without sin. Sinless. Sinless. Pure. Pure. Separate. Separate. Okay, I'm gonna. Sorry, Bathory, do apologise. Yep. Forgiven. Forgiven. You set apart. Set apart. He's above all. He's above all. Amen. Anybody else? <laughs> Distinctively different. Distinctively different. Righteous. Righteous. The unchangeable changer. The unchangeable changer. Somebody's been reading my commentaries. I've got set apart, dedicated, distinctive, supreme in, this is referring to God, supreme in his distinctiveness, unique and demanding in his uniqueness. God is holy. Amen? Amen. He is unique. He is a one of a kind. The idea, and I'm not going to say that I've written all this out because you can tell this is going to be word perfect, which means therefore I've clearly not written this. This has come from commentaries, this bit. The idea of holy is the, at the very heart of God's self-revelation and his call of Israel. 
This highlights two dimensions of God's holiness in the Old Testament. With respect to God, holiness is his quintessential nature, his very selfhood. With respect to humans, objects, times, places, and miscellaneous items like war and the covenant, holiness is always derived and dependent upon the proximity or relationship to the holy God. God's holiness is associated with other biblical and post-biblical words. Power, glory, transcendence, uniqueness, exclusiveness, pureness, dangerousness. It's actually a real word. I was really pleased with that. Somebody else puts a nus at the end of something and it's actually a real word. It's rather than me. Why am I quoting all of this? Well, Exodus 3, 5. The first moment of really picking up the concept of holy is where we have Moses approaching that bush that was aflame but not burning. Notice that we always call it the burning bush. It actually wasn't burning. It was aflame, but it wasn't being consumed by the flame. That's, anyway, relevant. As he approaches that Moses, he says, Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. This is the connotation, actually. The word is not, do not come any closer. It's actually, stop coming near as you are doing. Why? Well, Moses yet hadn't recognised the presence of the nature of God yet. He actually hadn't recognised who God was. Bring on, that's his first encounter with Yahweh. Yahweh's been guiding his steps since the day he was born, yes? But actually his first real encounter with God did not happen until really that moment. And he still didn't know who God was. He hadn't recognised who God was. So God's holiness was present. God was present, so you needed to stop coming as he was, just as he would do. He was curious to know what that bush was and why it was alive. Oh, let's go and have a look there. I wonder if he was going up with him. I wonder how hot it's going to get. Was it hot? There's a, there's, a, there's a nice debate for you. Was it actually giving off heat? If it wasn't consuming the bush... It's totally irrelevant to anything I want to talk about, but I just, just the question hit me. Maybe that's a debate for one Bible study evening. Anyway, what's made the ground holy? It's one answer, well, two answer, but two word answer. What made the ground holy? God's presence. Exactly what made the ground holy. The ground, I'm sure, Moses has been there plenty of times before. That's where the sheep or cattle or whatever he looked after, shepherded, would have been mulling around. He's probably been and seen that bush plenty of times up on that mountain. But it wasn't until God's presence did that ground then become holy. Did it become other? Did it suddenly become distinct? So Moses had to take off the sandals to his feet to approach as a sense of an act of reverence, a act of obedience to the holy God to whom he is approaching. He couldn't treat that particular mountain or piece of ground there or that bush differently, uh, sorry, as the same as he has done in the past. He needed to act differently when approaching that bush. He had to recognise the presence of the Holy God. Why take off his sandals? We just sometimes assume, oh, that's what you do. You take off his shoes when you decide I'm going to approach and, and, and be a little bit. We do sometimes here. We say, oh, you know, if you, you want to act out and recognise that you are in the presence of the Holy God, take off your shoes. Some people like me may not want to do that often. Not because I don't recognise the presence of God, but I recognise your presence and you may not want to... Anyway. (laughs) No, I don't have those anymore. It's 
partly probably part of the culture of the time, to just act differently when you recognise you're walking into the presence of a deity, for want of a better phrasing. Early Sumerian priests used to perform their duties naked. Took off all their coverings and all their pretense. So they're actually before their god, small g, I hasten to add, before their god, totally bare, no pretense, no nothing, recognising that as far as they're concerned, they're entering some presence of their holy god. Joshua 5, 15. Just want to turn to that. We've been studying this at the, uh, the house group, uh, Joshua, that meets in Barbara's home. Uh, if you're interested, we're going through the whole of Joshua at the moment. If you want to come along, we're meeting not this Wednesday, but Wednesday next week. Do see Barbara, who is here this morning. But it's in Joshua 5.15... Joshua, uh, well, I'll read the whole that section. When Joshua was near the town of Jericho, remember this, he's a, you know, Jericho's still standing. He looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a sword in hand. Joshua went up to him and demanded, love this, demanded, are you a friend or a foe? Neither one replied, I am the commander of the Lord's army. At this moment, Joshua fell to his face. Sorry, I love that. Can you imagine that? You see a geezer with a sword and you're a, you know, you've been in a few battles yourself and you're going to go up and say, who are you then, friend or foe? No, neither, I'm commander of the Lord's army. I love it. I'm at your command, Joshua said. What do you want your servant to do? The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did as he was told. Interesting that the current leader of Israel was still subordinate to God, even though he's got thousands following him. Awe and respect was the response due to the holy God. I do love the fact with Joshua that that is sense. He's thinking he's just walking up to some human being. Like Moses thought he was just walking up to some phenomenal bush that for some bizarre reason was aflame. And then discovering, actually, you're in the presence of the Holy God. Respond accordingly. Show respect. How do we show respect to our God? Real question. How do we show respect to our God? Uh, I think um, reverence for his name and also obeying his words. Okay. Reverence for his name and obeying his words. Did you? Exactly, what I was gonna exactly what Hannah was going to say. Excellent. Follow his commands. Follow his commands. Anybody else? Hmm. Respecting others. Respecting others, yes. Respecting others because they're made in the image of God. Yes, Carol, absolutely. Uh, a sin is an offence to God. So to show respect to God, we must try to avoid sin. Okay, thank you, Michael. I have an answer. Oh, sorry. Recognising that he's the God of all nations. Recognise that he's the God of all nations. Amen, I will... Sorry. It's like cinema sometimes. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Where's the popcorn? Not burying our talents in the ground. Not burying our talents in the ground, absolutely. Oh, thanks, Chris. <laughs> Look, it really is. Popcorn. Anyone? <laughs> it's clearly a, a word of knowledge I had at that moment. Not. We need to recognise God's power, God's authority. I'm ready for this, to respect God. Recognise his deep love. I never thought of that one before. Recognising his deep love. God has all the power, all authority and all love. 
It's quite something, really, when you think about it. And it feels like a strange enigma, doesn't it? This all-powerful God is all love. It's a strange enigma, this holy God. Because it will feel like a strange enigma when I start reading the next lot of verses. Because God is holy, his morality is higher than ours. His demand in his uniqueness is higher than ours. The way we approach people, society, his word, his commands, everything about it is actually the way he portrays he wants it to happen is higher than ours. I'm, not that I'm, I'm being political here, so hear me very, very carefully. All right? I'm being very apolitical at this point. But what's been going on this week uh, with the release of the documents, etc., and the, and the sense of um, offshore accounts and all that, and I am not making any comment either way. I'm commenting on the way it's being portrayed in the fact that, yes, it was legal. We're not sure if it was moral. You see, with God, there's not actually a difference either way for him. If it's legal, then for God, it's got to be moral. If it's moral, it's going to be legal. Does that make sense? There's never that sort of separation. And as I said, I'm not making a comment in regards to whether something was legal or moral here. But his call in his uniqueness, his holiness, is higher than what we would lay out. I have to, you know, we all have to admit to that. So in God's holiness, in his deep love, there are things that he demands of his people. And I'm going to show you how God responds to those who do not show the proper respect for him. You're not going to like it. It's going to make you uncomfortable. Levi, sorry, Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 to 3, states a moment here. Aaron's son, Aaron, the Levite priest, Nadab and Abihu, put coals of fire in their incense burners and sprinkled incense over them. In this way, they disobeyed the Lord by burning before him the wrong kind of fire, different than he had commanded so blazing, so fire blazed forth from the Lord's presence and burned them up, and they died there before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord meant when he said, I will display my holiness through those who come near me. I will display my glory before all people. Aaron, bearing in mind, who's just seen, known his sons are all burnt up, was silent. So what happened at that moment? What was wrong? What was wrong? Want me to reread it? Yeah? Okay. Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, put coals of fire in their incense burners and sprinkled incense over them. In this way, they disobeyed the Lord by burning before him the wrong kind of fire, different than he had commanded. So fire blazed forth from the Lord's presence and burned them up, and they died there before the Lord. Sorry, bro. They, di- they did what God asked, but they did their version of it. They did their version. I wouldn't say they did what God asked, but they did their version. You're right. Yeah. Were they holding back incense because it was um, something they might be able to sell, get money for? No. They just didn't hold anything back as far as we know. I think they thought they knew better than God, really. I think they think they knew better than God as well, yes. Um, I'm going to come right down here. I'm sorry, Bath. I will pay you money, maybe, for moving your knees a lot. Thank you. See, Timmy. They disobeyed pure and simple. They disobeyed pure and simple. Prior to all of that in the whole of the Old Testament, you will see laying out commands of how you are to approach God. 
He's given it a direct, clear cut. Very Sorry, I'm going to... How many of us would love to have it sometimes that each day we know exactly how we're meant to approach God? Nicely laid out, a nice set of rules. Get up at six o'clock in the morning. Do your five-minute prayer. And this is the prayer that you pray. Yeah? Who would like it really nicely laid out? Yeah, yeah, I'm seeing lots of hands. This, I knew this would happen. Yeah, it's old, isn't it? Look at us. Ooh. Yeah, actually, make it nice and easy. Make it nice and tight and simple. Come to church. Let's do our liturgy in a particular way. Arrive, bang on 10 o'clock. That's a laugh. Yeah, but notice that. Everyone, no, no, actually, then again, maybe not past the word. Maybe I don't want it laid out that easy. If you stroll in at 25 past, you've got to write out extra offering form. Yeah? yeah? But who would like it laid out? And if you've screwed up this week, if you've sinned and done this particular sin, this is your penance and equals this, yes? Who would like it nicely laid out? That's lovely, really. Some of you know and yet more to know. In the Old Testament, it was laid out really neatly what you're meant to do to approach the Lord. And they still did it wrong. So let's go back. Are you sure you want it neatly laid out? that's the legalistic way but they had it here neatly laid out how they're to do the incense and in what attitude they're to approach and the fact that the two brothers were going in together there was a sense of maybe there was some rivalry going on they were not approaching together with the right heart forget the way you do the incense and the fire if you've not done it right as the Lord commanded it clearly means your heart's not in the right place so God is saying, you can't approach my holiness, in the Old Testament terms here, with that sense of irreverence. So all-consuming fire, which we sung beautifully today, went... Whoa! And Father Aaron, do not say a word. And if you read the rest of the verses from uh, Leviticus 10, uh, actually Aaron was commanded not to mourn. They had done wrong. That's our holy God, whose deep love we have to recognise. Joshua 6, 21. Joshua chapter 6 verse 21 says this. This is after now that the walls of Jericho have collapsed and uh, the Israelite army have rushed on in. They completely destroyed everything in it with their swords. Men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, goats and donkeys. Everything. At God's command, which you see earlier in the chapter, wipe out everything. Kill everyone, except for, as we know, Rahab and her family. That's our holy, deep loving God. Sits uncomfortable with us. Sounds like mass genocide, as we were discussing in the group. This is God dealing with his enemies in totality due to the fact that he is a holy God. In Genesis 15, 6, God promises the land, this particular piece of land, but the Amorites, as it puts in Genesis 15, 6, haven't quite reached their full height of their sin, but God knows they will do. And when they have, then they need to be wiped out. As first puts it, God's holiness ultimately brooks no opposition but it always contains at least an implicit invitation to change illustrating the priority of mercy over judgment see when you look at the story that moment in Jericho you will notice that Rahab actually recognized that God was the supreme God so the reason she helped the spies is actually because she recognized that they were followers of God and she needed to yield her life to God which the rest of the city weren't doing Hence why her and her family were saved. Because God's mercy 
over his judgment. But God, our holy God, doesn't brook sin. There is a point that he says enough is enough. This is the same holy God. I'm going to read to you from Leviticus 19. Notice we're a lot in the Old Testament. We are going to move into the New Testament. I give you a breath of air for that. Leviticus 19. The Lord said to Moses, now this is in between, in the middle roughly, of what is known as the holiness code that's been given uh, in in Leviticus. The Lord said to Moses, give the following instructions to the entire community of Israel. You must be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Each of you must show great respect for your mother and father. And you must always observe my Sabbath days of rest. I am the Lord your God. Do not put your trust in idols or make metal images of gods for yourselves. I am the Lord your God. When you sacrifice a peace offering to the Lord, offer it properly so you will be accepted by God. The sacrifice must be eaten on the same day you offer it or on the next day. Whatever is left over until the third day must be completely burned up. If any of the sacrifice is eaten on the third day, it will be contaminated and I will not accept it. Anyone who eats it on the third day will be punished for defiling what is holy to the Lord and will be cut off from the community. Nicely still want those nice rules laid out neatly? When you harvest the crops of your land, do not harvest the grain along the edges of your fields and do not pick up what the harvesters drop. It is the same with your grape corn. Do not strip every last bunch of grapes from the vines and do not pick up the grapes that fall to the ground. Leave them for the poor and the foreigners living among you. I am the Lord your God. Adam and Venus walk along the streets picking up the last penny we see on the floor. Do not steal. Do not deceive or cheat another. Do not bring shame on the name of your God by using it to swear falsely, I am the Lord. Do not defraud or rob your neighbour. Do not make your hired workers wait until the next day to receive their pay. Do not insult the deaf or cause the blind to stumble. You must fear your God, I am the Lord. Do not twist justice in legal matters by favouring the poor or being partial to the rich and the powerful. Notice that fair judgement. Thought I just always judge people fairly, it says. Do not spread slanderous gossip among your people. Let that one stand. We in our Western society are very good at gossiping, in the wrong term of the phrase. Do not stand idly by when your neighbor's life is threatened. I am the Lord. Do not nurse hate. No, I won't. Do not nurse hatred in your heart for any of your relatives. Confront people directly so you will not be held guilty for their sin. Oh dear, that's another one, isn't it? Do not nurse hatred in your heart for any of your relatives. Are we feeling uncomfortable? I read this about five times this week and, oh, not that I've got hatred towards my relatives. Sorry, that's not the reason I... Do not seek revenge or bear grudge against a fellow Israelite, but love your neighbour as yourself. I am the Lord. You must obey all my decrees. That's Old Testament. That's living a holy life. All neatly laid out. And there is more. And at which point I'm hearing people in their heads going, ha-ha, but that's all Old Testament stuff. We'll nail post. We're with Jesus. Amen? Where do you think Jesus understood all the Sermon on the Mount stuff? Where do you think he based all his teaching of that from? From the Old Testament. Picking it up from this. But this is then the bit that I really love in the Old Testament. In Leviticus 21.8, it says, You must treat them as holy because they offer up food to your God. You must consider them holy because I, the Lord, am holy, and I make you holy. 
You must bring faithfully all my commands by putting them into practice, for I am the Lord. Do not bring shame on my holy name, for I will display my holiness among the people of Israel. I am the Lord who makes you holy. I don't know if you noticed, but the key theme for this morning is holy. I, the Lord God, make you It was I who rescued you from the land of Egypt, but I must be your God. I am the Lord. I, the Lord, make you holy. So this gets me, because we can have God up here in some lofty moment. And it's quite right, he is. But he is also a holy God, and we can think holy and, oh dear, untouchable, transcendent type thing. But actually, if he makes you holy, it means he's down here with you. Amen. <coughs> and bear that in mind, that's in the Old Testament. And we like to ignore the Old Testament. We seem to think that is a really judgeful, wrathful God, holy God, who is this far apart from his people. Yeah? But he can't be, because he says, if I make you holy, that's talking about his presence being with them. What made the ground holy? God's presence. What makes the Israelites holy? So what makes you holy? Who's doing it all? Should remind us of something else in the New Testament. We're finally going to the New Testament. 1 Peter 2, 4 to 10. which I really intelligently didn't mark. One Peter, two, four to ten. You are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He has rejected my people, but he has chosen by God for great honour. And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priests. Or priesthood. That's all of us. Amen? Amen? Not just talking about us who've got revs in front of our names. It's all of us. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offered spiritual sacrifices that please God. And then it jumps down. But you are not like that. For you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. A holy nation. God's very own possession. We're a holy people. You belong to God. Have you actually grasped that still? Yeah? Good. You are to live holy lives. Amen? Amen. Because our holy God commands it of us. Though he makes us holy, he says you've got to live in that holiness. That deep love. I go, oh good. I haven't got to do a lot then. But it's that teaching with the burning heart this morning. From Carol, that image of the heart burning, that much of deep love reaching out, we have to respond by approaching him. We can't approach him irrelevantly, though. We can't just take it as cheap grace. We have to come through his son, Jesus Christ, but we have to come with that sense of, yes, I am approaching the holy God. Joshua is an exact example. Who are you then? For us or what? I can imagine that real swagger he probably had slightly, you know what I mean? Sword in hand. Warrior type. Sees another geezer with a sword and thinks, yep, take this guy down. (laughs) Demanding, you tell me who you are. I'm the commander of the Lord's army. Slam, hit the ground. Treated him differently at that point. This holy God reached out from his loftiness and came down and reached out to us through his son Jesus. We have to recognise that and walk up to him, walk, approach, and it says approach his throne of grace with confidence. Absolutely. But recognise it's grace that brings you there. 
Is it Isaiah that said, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips and so is my, my, my fellow people, yeah? He approached it recognising in God's holiness presence that he's a man who is unclean. But recognise this, God went, yeah, okay, but anyway, here is burning coal, you are now a person of clean lips because I, God, have touched you. Do you see the point? So Isaiah did not need to sit in this sense of wretchedness before God. He recognised it approaching, but he didn't have to sit in it. Because God went, you're not now. So our God is a loving, deep loving, holy God. Amen? It's a point to this, you'll get it in a minute, it's the holiness. But this is the bit, because we're nicely comfortable with our loving, all-encompassing God. And I've shown you two judgments of God that God does from the Old Testament, yes? And we sit now in our lovely post-modern New Testament time and go, he doesn't do that anymore. Turn with me to Acts chapter 5. Oh, there's giggling now. Chapter 5. Because we've got to recognise that God is holy in the Old Testament and the New. Got to recognise that God turns around in the Old Testament and says, I make you holy. You don't make you holy. I make you holy by my presence. We go to the New Testament and goes, God says, you're a holy nation. I've made you holy because of my presence. The Holy Spirit living in you makes you holy. So we have between the Old and the New... An exact replica, yes? How we approach God has to be how he's prescribed. And he's prescribed it in the old in a set of rules, with sacrifices. The ultimate sacrifice was done by his son Jesus, but the rule still stands the same. You come into me via my son Jesus. Yeah? I know we know this, but we have to recognise it. In our lovely postmodern society, oh, there's lots of different routes. It's okay. The rules change. And when we read Leviticus and that holiness code and looking at some of those examples of how we should be treating others around us, that holds in the new. And then Acts 5, 1, I love this. I've had people say to me, oh, but God doesn't do that stuff anymore. Really? Read this. But there was a certain man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold some property. He brought part of the money to the apostles, claiming it was the full amount with his wife's consent, he kept the rest. Then Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit. You lied to the Holy God. And you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not sell as you wished. God wasn't going to be bothered if you did sell it or not sell it. That's the point he's making there. God would have been happy with you either way. What the issue here is, that after you sold it, the money was also yours to give away as you felt. You didn't have to bring it here. But how could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. This is the point. What made the ground holy? God's what? Presence. Presence. Who was Ananias and Sapphira? And you know that they, by the way, they died. Just to let you know, if you don't know that Ananias at that point fell down dead, then Sapphira came in about three hours later. Asked question was the same, you know, is this all the money from that land? <laughs> dead. I'm not talking about what's happened to after they die and about whether they're in heaven or not. That's not the conversation here. But the point is, it's the same thing. Why did that happen? Not because they tried to lie to the church, but it was because they were lying to God. Why were they trying to lie to God? What was it about the church they hadn't recognised? It's the same as the ground. God's presence was in the church. They tried to almost divorce church from God's presence. Isn't that interesting? Try to deceive the church. Or they tried to deceive God, but they thought they were just deceiving the church. Does that in the New Testament make you feel really comfortable? 
doesn't it, does it? Just think about it for a minute. Let's just reflect for a second. We talk about the love of God and absolutely, that should be always our driving force, is God's love for us. Not to get his approval by doing good works and all of that. But we still have to recognise his holiness. We can't divorce the two. It's because of his holiness that we are loved. Ananias and Sapphira did not get that. And as Bruce states here, the sovereignty of the Holy Spirit in the church is so real that any action done to the church is regarded as done to the Spirit. The Spirit of the Holy God, Ananias and Sapphira tried to see how how far they could push it. How far could they get away with? What happened? They found out to the cost of their lives. Look at the parable of the talents that Andy brought up. You can't bury them. If you look at that parable, God is really upset if you bury your talent. I'm sorry, you've got to take that. We've got to take that holy God that we worship, we know that loves us. And then let's take it absolutely to the end of time. What happens at the end of time? We give account. Thank you, Carol. Judgment Day has arrived. There is a separation between those who follow Christ and those who didn't. We like this idea of an all-loving God. Absolutely. But we like this idea of this all-loving God. We'll let everybody in no matter what at the end of it all. Sorry, that's not the Bible I'm reading. Who makes that judgment call about who's in and who's out? God does. Remember, his morality, his judgments are higher than ours. What's the point of today's sermon? That's a good point. The point of today is not for us to be fearfully in panic of the Lord, but it's to get a balance between the friendship of the Lord and the awesomeness of the Lord. There has to be that balance. It's a tension There's a tension in recognising the grace that's in our lives. The fact that we can approach his throne of grace with confident boldness because of what Jesus did. But also not to take it lightly and casually. That sense of cheap grace. There is a real balance and attention that has to be held and let's be honest we struggle with it because I believe wholeheartedly that actually we are to walk around not as condemned people but as people who are free in Christ we are to walk around as people with that sense and that knowledge we are loved and walk around with that boldness and confidence yes But we have to bold that with not that casualty and that lightness that says I can just do what I please and how I feel like it. We have to recognise the presence of God. And this is the best bit. I was watching a movie yesterday called Cowboys and Aliens. (laughs) Couldn't get much better of different genres for me. That's both the West and the world. I love all that. Bit of guns and horse riding. I've never horse ridden in my life. I actually was quite fearful of horses until a few years ago. They got big heads. (laughs) <laughs> but uh, I was uh, watching that last night just decided to just, just, just needed to chill out for the rest of the evening and watch that uh, so we put that on DVD and was watching that and I've watched it a couple of times and I'm not going to give a critique of the movie but it's got Daniel Gray, Craig in it apparently most women will go woo no okay fine good um, it's got Harrison Ford in it it's a real combination actually for me. It was aliens and it had like Star Wars in it with Harrison Ford. It's great. And Indiana Jones. Anyway, no, I'm moving on. But there's a great sign. There's an actor called Clancy Brown who uh, plays in one of my most favourite movies in Highlander. I'm just giving you a whole critique of movies. I thought you might prefer this over holiness. Um, but Clancy Brown plays an evil. Anyway, but in this movie, he's playing the preacher. 
And he has to fix quickly Daniel's side with his gunshot wound. And he pours some alcohol over it, whiskey over it, to help cool, you know, keep it clean. And then takes a swig. And uh, anyway, so Clancy Brown is a sort of very down-to-earth preacher, very practical in everything he does. Uh, very sort of teaching uh, the local uh, publican how to shoot because all their sort of partners have been sort of kidnapped by some aliens. That's the point. Watch the movie if you want to. Um, but anyway, the point is, why he's teaching the, the publican, the bar owner, to shoot some, uh, try and shoot, <laughs> to try and uh, shoot straight. This is the preachers teaching him. <laughs> Be afraid. Be very, very afraid. Um, uh, the, the publican is like, oh, just life has been terrible. And, uh, and, and the preacher says, well, you've got to have faith. And he says, and the publican turns around and he says, yeah, well, either God doesn't exist or he doesn't like me very much. And then there's a line the preacher comes out, well, I don't quite agree with, but they're talking about the presence of God. But this bit I do get. He says, the presence of God. He said, you've got to learn to recognize his presence and then respond to it. What's the point? Do you recognise the presence of God with you every moment of every day? The holy God who is with you at every moment of every day. Do you recognise it? Do you, like me, at times struggle to remember that he's there? Yes, I'm being honest as a pastor. Just because sometimes I stick this thing in doesn't mean it's, oh yeah, it's God. Sometimes I forget that when I'm going into a place, there is God. My holy God who watches my every move. Not there as judgment, but there as love. I need to recognise that everywhere I go, I am walking in the very presence of our holy God. Holding that balance. Holding that tension. As I said, this is not about feeling us, making us feel hammered. But this is the point for me. When church is gathered, be it here on Sunday mornings, bang on 10 o'clock, be it here at members' meetings, be it here at Shekinah evenings, be it have it at all that I am days, like next Saturday, be it at your house groups, be it when you're meeting in the cafe, having nice breakfast, Dennis, yes, with your friends, re-studying the Bible. Wherever it is, you are gathered in the holy presence of our holy God. Amen? Amen. And that constant struggle between finding the tension between the truth that we are a forgiven people, we are sanctified, we are a holy people, we're free from condemnation, against this truth that we have to recognise our holy God is with us. And therefore then we should never take those gatherings together lightly we're meeting in the presence of the holy God and when we recognise that we are in his presence we have to respond to that accordingly I've not read the nice, comfortable passages from the Bible. Strangely enough, we don't worship or are in the presence of a comfortable God. We're in a unique being. Words can't even describe him, if we're honest. That does not make him comfortable. That makes him almost unknowable because there he is one of a kind therefore what we consider to be comfortable by the way he is knowable in the fact that he reaches out to us but we are worshipping a holy God not a comfort blanket but we're worshipping a holy God who loves us
So when you wake up tomorrow morning, and I assume you're going to wake up tomorrow morning, recognize you've woken up in the presence of the Holy God. You're still in the presence of a holy God. God never said that our lives would be all comfort and wonderful. I see that in the, Old, in the New and the Old Testament. Most of the apostles who brought us these messages died a very painful and horrible death because of their faith. That's not a comfortable life. You're still in the presence of the holy God who asks us to treat everybody else around us differently or with love, including the people that we come up with. Carol said it, you know, because we're made in the image of God. You look at everybody else around you as made in the image of that holy God. Dennis and Pat, you're both made in the image of that holy God. Look at each other. You're very different in every respect. <laughs> but you are made both in that image. So is everybody in this room. And so is everybody who's your next door neighbour who you may not like. I love all my neighbours in my street. Clarify that. Because they see some of this. Let's take a few moments of quiet now to reflect on what God might have been saying to you about him. Lord, Heavenly Father, as it says in your word, the high and lofty one who lives in eternity, the holy one, says this. I live in the high and holy place with those whose spirits are contrite and humble. I restore the crushed spirit of the humble and revive the courage of those with <coughs> repentant hearts. Lord, thank you that you do live with us. We are in the present always of you when we come to you with humility. We know that we will have courage because of our humility. We know that we can walk with you in confidence because of our humility in walking with our holy God. I pray for each of us that we will recognise your holy presence with us through the coming weeks and months that we will be changed and transformed because of us recognising that the presence of the Holy God is with us and we are called to live that holy life. Lord, thank you. It's not a set of nicely laid out rules. It's about relationship. It's about proximity to you. I pray each of us will grasp that more and more fully. In the name of Jesus. Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.